Ladies and gentlemen, with the next returning raid to Destiny, you can catch me casting the entire thing. You ever wanted to see the best raid teams in Destiny all competing on the grand stage? Well, look no further than my Twitch channel, where we will be co-streaming and casting every single team racing. If that sounds like a good plan to you, click the link in the description, follow my Twitch, and turn notifications on. More news coming in the future. The most stapled weapons, the most stapled characters, and the most changed mode in Destiny. Welcome to the Iron Banner. The Iron Banner is an endgame PvP activity that has been in Destiny since the beta in July of 2014, and for the first time in a long time, has become a highlight of rework. All the way from Season 1 of, well, I guess not even Season 1, the beta of Destiny 1, to Season 17, Season of the Haunted, has taken the pain points of Iron Banner's Destiny 2 streak and has tried to rework it to something greater. As we all know, Destiny has gone through so many changes over its 8 year run from 2014, and that many years does a lot to the modes. So much change happens for better or for most of the time worse, and Iron Banner has been in that crossfire going from a beloved rock star of a mode to a shell of its former self. So much so that the community even wanted it to be removed for a little bit. Iron Banner used to feature things like unique cosmetics, weaponry that was not only amazing, but at times so strong it called for major changes, and some incentive for achieving max rank. There was even a whole DLC centered around its characters, and these good boys walking around the Iron Temple. To a new player, Iron Banner may seem like this weird variant of PvP where there's a new announcer and some small changes. But to veterans of Destiny, this mode used to mean unlimited amounts of fun and a chase for something fantastic. If there's anything to know, it's that Iron Banner is a big deal for Destiny, whether you want to believe that or not. Strap yourself in, throw on your high socks, snapbacks, and cargo shorts to join me on a trip back to 2014, a time of console-only Destiny, and at a time where Destiny seemed like a larger-than-life experience. If you do or don't learn anything new, if you have fun watching this video, or just want to show some love, be sure to drop me a like and a subscription. I see that the majority of you who are watching these videos aren't subscribed, and this just goes a long way again. So be sure to subscribe, hit the bell like players did in the Iron Temple. Speaking of which, Iron Banner. Let's get into it. Some footage in this video is from players around the community. Their links will be in the description of this video as well as the music too. Also, some footage you guys should definitely come watch. Evan F1997 on Twitch. I stream almost every single day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Iron Banner was once a celebrated mode by the masses, and you may wonder why. Back in 2014, the brand new tower for the brand new beta that came with Destiny was full of things to do. Things like visiting different vendors, finding dead ghosts, hitting the bounty board, turning on the fan over the postmaster, getting on top of the vaults, kicking the purple ball around, and wondering why certain portions of the tower were blocked off. That wonder of something so close yet so far is part of the reason why Destiny 1 felt so much bigger than just us. We may have seen the west wing of the tower in the opening mission of Destiny 2, but in July of 2014, and only for a total of two hours, this gate that was blocked at the north side of the tower was lifted. Inside sat the beautiful view of the world, and the music added to that atmosphere, but to the right stood a character wearing a pearlescent coat of armor. This vendor, Lord Saladin. The loot, unique. His story, one for the ages. We will get to Saladin's story later, 
but Iron Banner was just not some throwaway idea that arrived in the tower to pad out the game. Iron Banner was a part of the Destiny identity. Destiny was and still remains to be one of the most ambitious franchises to exist. And while we see the PvP side of Destiny to be less exciting in the current era, in the beginning of Destiny 1, it was the main selling point of the game. So many Halo fans and Call of Duty fans came together for the sell of just that, the best gunplay of all time. Both franchises having a baby, and the satisfaction of clicking heads in the Crucible becoming and still remaining the most satisfying feeling in any FPS. So if you're into the PvP side, and the PvP side is such a big sell for the game, the unexpected, but way ahead of its time ambitious next step is a limited time, high stake, decorative, end game with unique rewards. This was the Iron Banner, and it was amazing. Not only did the Iron Banner have a limited time to enjoy it every month in Destiny, but it also had limited time rewards that rotated. I will never forget the days of jumping into an Iron Banner to reap rewards, and damn near miss school the next morning grinding out for an auto rifle I was probably never going to use. Uh, just don't tell Mama F 1997. The main sell for Iron Banner wasn't that it was just PvP. The main sell is that it had stakes and scarcity for players that didn't reach the elusive max rank for Iron Banner rewards. The Iron Banner acted as a faction the way the Future War Cult did, the way that Dead Orbit did, and the way that New Monarchy did. These factions all had a reputation system with an easy to see level goal to purchase items, and Iron Banner followed this to a T. Iron Banner started with two shaders, two emblems, four pieces of armor, and a weapon in the beta. There were unique bounties to it, and reputation to be earned from wins and games played. Speaking of games played, after each match of Control Zone, the post-game screen would roll for everyone. And of course, the teammate that top performed every match never got a reward. We love Destiny. In the beta, the only drops unique were Timmer's Lash, a hand cannon, and a ship named the Birth of History. To also add to the element of grand endgame experience, the Iron Banner had light level enabled, basically meaning if I was a higher level than you were, I would do more damage than you and receive less from you. Iron Banner was trying to establish itself for the best of the best, and the feedback for Iron Banner in the beta was that it didn't have a lot in the way of new. Sure, the rewards were scarce, and the RNG of the post-game screen was a turnoff to some, but Deej would remind us that this was just the beta, and a lot more was coming. Iron Banner officially debuted on October 7th of 2014 for Destiny, about a month after the initial launch, which meant that Destiny had a lot of packing for this mode to come out a month later. Iron Banner was right after the Queen's Wrath event, and it featured the same loot as the beta for reputation ranks. The weapon featured for max rank, however, happened to be the Yolder's Hammer, a staple to the Destiny franchise for it just nuking other players. This weapon was exactly one of many reasons Iron Banner just worked in Destiny. I think Iron Banner in its infancy was best summed up by saying that it was a character itself. It arrived. It wasn't shoved in your face. The weapons from its end goal every go around were definitely more powerful, but it was the end chase of that Iron Banner, making young Evan immediately go, what is that? Can we also talk about the armor from this event? Guys, please, look at the fits Iron Banner came out with. And I don't think I've seen a Hunter Cloak look this good in Destiny 2. I'm just saying. It wasn't all perfect, though, as the second Iron Banner would go through some major controversy and issues. After only three hours of the second Iron Banner existing, it would need to be canceled completely with Bungie stating that the old Iron Banner was the one they pushed out in week 2 as well. 
Bungie wanted to add a medallion system to the mode in week two, but this was an utter train wreck that slipped under the radar and goes to show that Destiny has always had problems. We just know about games and the bad side of what happens a lot more these days given how news moves. It's not to bash Destiny or other games, it's to say that sometimes we expect a lot from games and when they have a stumble, especially nowadays, we make it the talk of the town for the entire world. Nothing is perfect and just like every person out there, games and companies make their mistakes too. Bungie would add in all those systems we talked about in the next Iron Banner as week 2 was completely replaced with Mayhem instead and this real second Iron Banner would be pushed back two weeks to November 18th. This time it featured major changes like your upgraded damage attack rating affecting how much damage you do. You remember that Destiny Vanilla Classic of upgrading damage on your weapons? Defeats also granted a token to be redeemed after a future win, and you could carry up to 5 iron medallions at any time. In addition, Salad Man now had 5 full ranks to acquire, and wearing the Iron Banner emblem and shader gave extra ranks too. Side note, I remember thinking this applied to everything in the game, including Nightfalls, so I can remember wasting all of my hard earned motes of light on emblems, thinking I would get better odds at exotics in the Nightfalls. Yeah. I didn't get Galahorn for a year. But you know what would have helped me get Galahorn? If I used Code Evan at Gamersubs. Listen, man, hear me out one more time. Gamersubs, they've teamed up with me and they've given away a bunch of free samples, but not a lot of people use those free samples. So we have a bunch of just free, like shipping for like, like completely like zero, nothing. So if you guys click the link in the description, go straight to Gamersubs, you type in code 300K on a one-time sample pack, that's it. That That's it. It's free. Zero. Zero, zero, zero. And if you really like it, you can always use code Evan at checkout. It supports me a lot, and we're getting really close to getting ourselves a shaker. Thank you, guys. Some time passed for Destiny's Iron Banner, but the next week of note for the mode was when Crota's End released. This time was where the Iron Banner would receive the infamous Ephrodite Spear a low zoom sniper with the strongest perk combination of all time in PvP. This sniper could roll with armor piercing rounds to shoot through walls for kills, and it's something that I wish Destiny still had. It was so satisfying clicking heads through a wall. I mean, how is that not satisfying? I'll tell you why it's not satisfying. If you died to final round, this final round perk could roll on the sniper and the perk gave the final bullet of the sniper extra damage to the point where you could one-shot leg someone. To say it was absurd is an understatement, and it quickly became everyone's go-to sniper for PvP, and you knew damn well who had a final round shot, because all you would hear at the beginning of every single match or every time someone respawned was do 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 do. This was also a great time in the Iron Banner because you could get level 31 gear for hard mode Crota's End, something that a lot of people didn't have. So overall, this was a major victory for Bungie and the Iron Banner. Now to the House of Wolves, probably Destiny's most underrated DLC of all time, we have the staying power of not only Prison of Elders, not only Trials of Osiris, but the Iron Banner. This was when vendor re-rolling was introduced, and for a pretty low cost of materials, you could re-roll specific weapons from that season. One weapon shined the brightest with this change, and has become the most infamous Iron Banner weapon ever. Even more infamous than Ephrodite's Spear, the Felwinter's Lie. Not only could this thing roll with final round, it could also roll with shot package to reduce the spread of the shotgun pellets. It could roll with Hammer Forge rifling with shot package for even more range, and why not? Let's just add even more RNG. You could get luck in the chamber, which made one bullet in your mag do an absurdly higher amount of damage. Oh, and if you didn't like that, you could always run with knee pads to slide further with the shotgun. You can imagine how big this weapon was for Destiny, and you can imagine how long it took to get a god roll from the gunsmith. But my god, you were built different with this thing in Crucible. Almost unstoppable. Unless someone had final round Ephrodites, that's, that's the only way you're getting stopped. 
other than that there wasn't too many weapons of note to introduce there was the scory's revenge pulse rifle which smoked everything in front of it but nothing too crazy other than those so that was the first year of iron banner and some would call it the golden age for the mode with all that new and all that broken fun to have iron banner had every reason to be there you could look cool you could grind for gear that was max level you could grind for some of the strongest pvp weapons in the game and the mode wasn't every two weeks or so only being offered twice per dlc thus adding more excitement when it appeared for a week how would the taken king handle such a big shift in destiny though well by sunsetting every year one weapon what you thought sunsetting just happened in destiny 2 yeah that's right bungie sunset weapons before but in destiny 1 i think it made a lot of sense there were some serious power creep problems and even exotics got the boot which is something that if they tried now oh god i don't even i don't even know what what would the community even do anything from iron banner loot all the way to even gallahorn got sunset so bungie came down swinging this was to introduce a whole new leveling system that we still mostly have with the infusion system but we're focused on iron banner today so what was that really like iron banner wouldn't drop for a whole month and some change but when it debuted again on october 13th the armor was amazing and there was new maps to roll with there was quests like the chaperone to jump into iron banner with new iron banner exclusive weapons like the sidearm iron wreath d and sidearms were also relatively new being introduced in the house of wolves but this sidearm was the next step up in quality also gone was scory's the pulse rifle and in stepped the nerwin's mercy which was also just insane overall it felt like even though sunsetting happened bungie was able to back it up with a flurry of brand new loot and this isn't where it ends you see as time went on and as bungie kept reinventing iron banner iron banner would swap modes to things like clash and even trying their hand at rift but that didn't go too well there were currency changes to buy loot with legendary marks instead of glimmer there was the finale's peril the hand cannon Pareto mart stand the machine gun reputation increases streak rewards cosmetics like a new ghost new artifacts and way more this trend of new would just continue throughout the taken king's time and even though the criticism for this dlc was that all the content just released at once and then left destiny players still had some long-lasting rewards to grind for in the iron banner now the only thing that's not perfect and something that i cannot stand is that destiny had playstation exclusive armor even for the iron banner that looked really good and i'm just so happy that console exclusives existed i'm really hoping and i mean i'm really hoping that bungie and sony don't do that again now that they're back in bed together nothing else of note really happened for the year of the taken king i mean iron banner got canceled again on june 20th of 2016 for just matchmaking not working again destiny things so now it's time we hit the temple rise of iron a whole dlc centered around the iron lords a whole dlc centered around siva a whole dlc to pet these good boys in the iron temple rise of iron quickly became a fan favorite dlc a smaller development team was working on this one while the larger team worked on destiny 2 and as a celebration of the success of destiny rise of iron really just perfected what made the game so special combining the elements of the taken king with the dressed in the end game destiny players love and returning every exotic from vanilla destiny 1 well almost every exotic the story was short and sweet but players learned the real meaning of becoming an iron lord and for the very few learned how to climb this peak and for the even fewer learned how to play the iron temple song iron banner would also returned strong here and since saladin was dealing with the siva crisis it was time for a new iron banner vendor to come into town 
meet Lady Ephrodite without the spear. There was just so much new here. New loot and new standouts like the clever Dragon Pulse Rifle and the Proud Spire Shotgun and oh my god look at this armor. The new coolest feature would be that Ephrodite gives us a quest to unlock a new part of the Iron Temple that was previously only opened by a rare drop in the Wrath of the Machine raid. This area combined with the new aesthetic, the new PvP maps, the new weapons, new armor, everything, you know, I'm just going to keep going, everything, just made Iron Banner special. I think my favorite part of this iteration of Iron Banner was the aesthetic of the weapons. Always feeling like you were back in a time before Destiny's Guardians even existed, and the power fantasy was really real here. We wouldn't see a ton of changes in the systems of Iron Banner, just perfecting what already works so well. With Age of Triumph, Bungie tried Mayhem Clash for Iron Banner, and most people just kinda had fun, waiting for the even better Destiny 2, right? Destiny 2 released with a game that was set up and doomed to fail, and Iron Banner felt those effects. No longer was PvP 6v6, it was 4v4. No longer did you have a special weapon. You had a kinetic and an energy primary with a formerly special weapon in the heavy slot. And no longer were abilities and supers able to really be used. Most of the time you would just time out and the game would end due to time instead of a score. Not only that, but instead of a reputation system for wins and streaks, Bungie replaced this with tokens? So no longer was the grind super strong, it was all about turning these in for some loot. The problem was, without random rolls on weapons, why even have half of those tokens? What is the point when there is no roll to chase? Once you have a gun, that's it. So yeah, Iron Banner was not getting a lot of love, just like the rest of the game of Destiny 2 Vanilla. Another reason why Iron Banner felt so off was the idea of unlocking a special space for it just going away. In the new tower, there was no secret area. There was no Ephrodite. Just Saladin standing there with his same gong, but in a cramped area of the tower. It just lost its impact. On a more personal note, the Iron Banner armor from the base game just wasn't the same hype as the Rise of Iron armor. It felt like Bungie took a step back across the board, and the Iron Banner felt those effects. This whole year would really be held back by these changes, but the massively positive notes here would be the Iron Banner armor ornaments in both Curse of Osiris and Warmind. These sets just look amazing, and were just kind of tossed in the DLCs without a massive amount of promotion about them. Other than that, the weapons from this year would have some staples, like the Multimac, Krimmel's Dagger, Ganora's Axe, the Steady Hand, and the Hero's Burden. These weapons were definitely great, and I don't think they should be looked at as anything other than that. But Destiny 2 just didn't feel the same that year, and it would take a miracle to get Destiny back to what made it special. Destiny needed a miracle, and it got one with Forsaken. Nearly everything Year 1 did wrong, Year 2 tried to remedy. Forsaken came out with a nuke of content, and Iron Banner felt those effects. New armor set, new maps, new weapons, new, new, new. The only part that stayed, and that everyone still didn't like, was the token system. But power level advantage did return from Year 1's absence, so it was mostly a success. Weapons like Claws of the Wolf and Wizened Rebuke were brand new here, but the main breadwinner for this year came in the Season of Opulence with the Swarm of the Raven Grenade Launcher. While the other weapons were good for PvP, this one made quick work of any boss, because it stacked with so many buffs and debuffs to the point where it made every single raid boss just kind of fall over. This isn't what the Iron Banner was known for, but I'll be damned if it wasn't amazing. Oh my God. Let's fucking go, dude. 
the Iron Banner may have been a return to Destiny 1 quality in terms of its loot, but I would say that the demand was catching up with Bungie, as a lot of weapons were reintroduced from year 1, but this time having random rolls. For every new weapon, there were two reintroduced, and you could feel that the Iron Banner was starting to take a back seat. It was no longer feeling like something that appeared, instead something a little bit more formulaic and expected again. You could say it's just due to age, but I would say it's due to a lack of innovation. It just felt bland outside of the loot. So would Shadowkeep be able to change that, or would Iron Banner just remain about the same? In Shadowkeep, Bungie went independent, and those effects are felt so heavily in this DLC. No new weapons were brought into the initial launch of Shadowkeep and Iron Banner, and one new armor set that looked... I mean, it looks okay. The ornaments from Curse of Osiris and Warmind also never returned. In fact, they're still gone to this day. So, yeah. One new PvP map is all you got in Shadowkeep as well. So no new weapons for Iron Banner, one new armor set, and one map. This was the era of Iron Banner that players just wanted to remove the mode entirely, since there was almost no change from regular Crucible and no special feel to it anymore. Later on, a weapon called the Point of the Stag would be introduced to Iron Banner, but it was already a little too late for players to be happy with. Bungie announced that a massive amount of content would be Sunset, and this one was right in the crosshairs. So it was just, and I say this with no pun intended, pointless to have. Another weapon to return that didn't come in the form of Iron Banner, but I figured it's important we talk about, was the Felwinter's Lie. This was a really cool mission from the story perspective, but unfortunately the mission was held back because of a bug with the f door. I think we just gotta go to orbit, boys. I'm so f***ing heated, dude. I'm trying not to scream. So this is what the content's gonna be the rest of the night. It's me driving down to the f***ing moon bunker and starting the mission and going, Oh shit! Spawned Eris again! Right. Can't wait to drive back down! Yeah, this door was the ultimate raid boss. Only Telesto could probably break in. Bellwinter's Lie, after the mission worked, was an absolute unit in the Iron Banner. And I would argue that it was a pinnacle weapon in disguise being the only shotgun in the game with the perk shot package. Other than that, well, Iron Banner exclusive perks like Iron Gaze and Iron Grip would be introduced in the Season of Arrivals, but again, that wasn't the story players were focused on. That was the last thing on their minds. Just like Felwinter's Lie, players were focused on sunsetting and not much else. It's unfortunate, but it's reality. So would Beyond Light restore a bunch of weapons? introduce new ones the way the Taken King had before? Well, let's just find out. Listen, I'm not someone to just rip and rip on Destiny all day. It gets old, it gets boring, you've heard about it a million times, and it's a waste. But in the Iron Banner, I think it's warranted here. Two years in a row, with Beyond Light and with Shadowkeep, of minimal new. A lot of players were frustrated that Sunsetting only reintroduced weapons instead of pushing out new ones. The Iron Banner was now a recycled banner, which was in direct contrast to what Bungie set out to achieve with Sunsetting to begin with. In Destiny 1, Sunsetting happened, but all new loot came in all the time to supplement living in a post-Sunset game. In Destiny 2, Sunsetting happened, and the first reward from the first campaign mission was a sniper players lost the season before. To say that the community felt like this was a slap in the face was an understatement, and the effects of Sunsetting are still felt to this day. If you can't meet the bar that Bungie has made in the past, you're just kind of asking for players to be frustrated. The good news would come later in the year when the best shotgun since Felwinter's Lie was introduced in the Wristwalker, and with the new Iron Reach perk. Iron Banner at least had a reason to be there, and players flocked back to the mode. The following season would introduce the Sidearm Peace Bond. 
being the first ever stasis weapon in Iron Banner, as well as Forge's Pledge, a solar pulse rifle. Other than that, ladies and gentlemen, nothing new in the Iron Banner for another year, and no changes that are really worth discussing. Now, let's get to the rework and the modern era, and oh my god, if you've made it this far, you are insane. Thank you. So, Witch Queen. We don't fully know what to expect. Maybe by the end of the year, Witch Queen will have some serious heavy hitters, but this was also supposed to be the year Iron Banner was completely reworked for Destiny 2. And so far, it's been, it's been all right. In the season before the rework, two weapons were added, a lightsaber and a 180 hand cannon. Just ignore the 180 hand cannon part. Look at the lightsaber. But in the season of The Haunted, where we currently reside, Iron Banner has now become Rift, the championed PvP mode of Destiny 1. And um, well, in, in Destiny 1, Rift was removed from Iron Banner because uh, people were getting steamrolled and they didn't like it, something that people are complaining about right now. I will say that the changes made here for the title, and especially for the reputation gain, are welcome to me. Earning more from wearing gear, earning more from completing the challenges. Now there's even a title to go with it for the Iron Lord, which we already were named in Destiny 1 after beating. Guys, I think Bungie forgot that Rise of Iron happened. I'm convinced. Rift has some serious issues that the community wants remedied, but it's back and there's even a new PvP map after just about 900 days. That's it's OK. I think that Bungie needs to just give people the older armor ornaments and even the Destiny 1 armor and weapons. I know that's not what you want to hear, but I know they want to combine the games in some meaningful way. Could you imagine the reaction from players getting some banging weapons from Destiny 1? Or in a crazy world, a lot of new weapons that are worth the chase. I also think Iron Banner needs to return to being a new area of the tower when it arrives. I really feel like players love that portion of the Iron Banner in Destiny 1, and it feels missing today. The cherry on top would be an NPC like Ephrodite returning to the tower, or a brand new NPC to cement the legacy, because as it stands, and even with a rework, Iron Banner has lost its charm that once made it the king. I think nostalgia is always a factor, but I do think that Iron Banner feels in a weird place. Like, the weird one for me is that Saladin last season, after going through probably one of the most amazing cutscenes I've ever seen, is then taken in as captive prisoner by Keitel, but still gets to run the Iron Banner. Like, it just makes no sense. Hopefully with all that information though, and the two of you that are still watching and can take it in, we can see that Iron Banner has had a weird, bumpy history. It was once a prominent mode that had the main incentive of loot turned into a mode that just exists to have pinnacles. I really hope we see these reputation changes make a big impact, but I'm not sure Iron Banner will ever return to its greatness. Anyway guys, I hope I wasn't too critical of Iron Banner, and I hope I did the best job of explaining the history of Iron Banner. Special shout out to Sick Boy and Clout God, both of you are amazing friends, amazing mods, and thank you for helping me come together with the research on this video. I'd like to also give a shout out to Patty Cakes and Ascendant Nomad. I asked them some questions about the state of Iron Banner, and they were very, very responsive and very, very helpful. So I'll put links to their channels in the description as well. For those of you that are still watching and uh, aren't subscribed, I encourage you to subscribe. I also encourage you guys to watch my live streams at EvanF1997 on Twitch. And finally, again, I really encourage you guys to use code Evan at Gamersubs. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day, and uh, I'll see you next time.